if there is anyone who is trying to get into the meeting who I don't see or anything else is going very badly wrong, don't hesitate to unmute yourself and draw it to my attention. I should say in this context, when I say going very badly wrong, this relates to the mechanics of the lecture, uh, the content of the lecture, if it's going badly wrong, you'll have an opportunity to ask me about uh, later on. I'm talking today in this 17th lecture on issues to do with Popper and politics. I mentioned last time that when Popper was very young, about 16, he saw himself as being a Marxist and worked inside the offices of the Austrian Communist Party. I would say that his reaction against Marxism was in part an emotional one uh, relating to his involvement, but uh, he subsequently was engaged in discussions with people about Marxism. And so the content of his critical discussion of Marxism in the open society wasn't just based on the memories of someone who was 16. He was, though, shocked when a demonstration organized by the communists led to the death of young workers and people who were unarmed. And this led him to rethink whether he had good reasons for his belief in Marxism. And it seems also to have led him to doubts about reason as such. Well, Popper has argued that it was also what led him to his concerns about how to demarcate between empirical and non-empirical claims, and thus eventually to his philosophy of science. Although, as I think I mentioned last time, one needs to be a, a little cagey about this just on the grounds that some relatively late writings of Popper's talk about demarcation in terms of the form of inductivism. Popper, however, in Vienna remained a socialist and he was involved in an educational movement for the reform of education, which was linked to the Austrian Social Democrats. Popper was, however, increasingly concerned about the consequences of the Social Democrats' forms of Marxism on the dynamics of politics in Austria. That's to say, in his judgment, they combined talk about, in principle, violent revolution with not taking key political action, for example, against the spreading influence of the Nazis there. But the alternative in Austria, what could be summarized as a form of clerical fascism, was certainly, in his view, much worse. As a result of personal experience of some problems of the bureaucratic organization of the Vienna city government, plus theoretical reflection, Popper came to see bureaucracy and the problems of its control as a key issue facing socialism. But he found that socialist friends either didn't seem to accept that there really was a problem here, or if they did, they did not have good ideas as to how one should react to it. The result of all this was that Popper in consequence seems gradually to have moved away from socialism. Although socialist attitudes, and indeed, as we talked about last time, some ideas from Marxism made a continuing mark on his work. At the time of his open society, his views might perhaps be best described as a kind of radical humanitarianism. Politically, he became concerned about the uncritical adoption of political ideologies between which there was no rational way of making decisions. While his own personal relations to socialism were a bit complex. See on the former of these, his public and private values, about which I'm going to say something a bit later in this lecture, and on the latter, his correspondence with Rudolf Carnap. Both of these are now in his open society, and they said a little bit about the discussion with Carnap last time. Popper moved to New Zealand, where he spent the Second World War. 
While he was there, he published not only on technical issues, for example, on the theory of probability, but he also started to write on issues to do with social philosophy. When Germany invaded Austria, he tells us that he decided to write a book on political issues. As I noted in the last lecture, he had been concerned about issues to do with the possibility of making prophecies about the course of history, which he understood both Marxism and the Nazis' ideas to involve, and he gave talks in Belgium and at the LSE on the theme of the poverty of historicism, a critique of this notion of being able to make rational prophecies. We don't know much about the substance of this early work just because he seems to have discussed and reworked his ideas in New Zealand, for example, with an economics lecturer, a chap called Colin Simpkin, and he, Hayek sent him, after they'd met at the LSE, uh, various off-prints, which in terms of offering a picture of the methodology of economics, seem to have made some impact on Popper as well. But he tells us that at some point, he decided to separate what became the open society out of the poverty of historicism. He discusses this in his unended quest. The open society, which included all kinds of material, especially in the footnotes, there's discussion in there of Wittgenstein, all kinds of things, was the result. Although in addition to the poverty of historicism, it's also worth noting that his what is dialectic, which is available in Conjectures and Refutations, dates from a paper that Popper gave to a seminar in New Zealand in 1937. So if you're interested in his social ideas at that point, it's worth looking at all three of those things. And it might usefully be read alongside the open society and the poverty. And if we wish to understand Popper's views at that time, uh, it's also worth noting that in the collection after the Open Society, we included some lectures that Popper gave in New Zealand, which contain in an earlier form material that ended up in the Open Society. Not everything in those lectures went into the Open Society. Uh, there is a, a, a lecture uh, about uh, themes to do with science and religion, which doesn't go into there. But you can see, in effect, earlier versions, slightly earlier versions of some of the open society material there. The open society itself is written largely by way of a critical engagement with Plato and with Marx. Plato figures because in Popper's view, not only was he influential in leading good-hearted people to dismiss democracy, but because Popper became struck by the existence of certain parallels between Plato and Hitler. Some ideas about this are set out in a piece called The Theory of Totalitarianism. It wasn't published by Popper, but we've included it in After the Open Society. In particular, Popper saw each of them as responding to the uncertainties of the period of social change, by way of an attempt to restore a stronger sense of community that supposedly people had enjoyed in the past. Popper found Plato intellectually impressive. There is clearly an intellectual attraction for Popper in Plato. But at the same time, he came to the conclusion that Plato's politics had been systematically misrepresented notably in the English-speaking world. Popper felt that he'd been represented as if he was a theorist of kind of upper-class paternalism towards society as a whole. Indeed, the ethos of sports and elitism combined with an ethos of service towards the general interest was close to what people got in the British public schools. And there is a, I, I mean, other, particularly this notion of sports as an important training. I mean, why someone should think that 
uh, uh, playing sports rather than as they're often now disclosed as doing, giving people different forms of brain damage should be a, a useful prerequisite to education isn't at all clear. But this notion of the education of an elite such that it is obliged to act in the interest of the community as a whole is indeed quite close to how Plato's politics was being represented. And the uh, criticism of democracy would be seen as being very much like uh, uh, criticism of populism today. Popper really wanted to say that aspects of Plato's views that didn't fit that model had tended to be ignored. Or in some cases, that Plato had been mistranslated to make him more liberal and humane than he actually was. There was, however, another reason that Popper wrote against Plato. I mentioned in earlier lectures the way in which Popper's views were in part formed by way of interaction and discussion with Julius Kraft, and through him with Leonard Nelson's Fries Schule. Nelson, in addition to his writings on logic and epistemology, which made a real mark on Popper, in, not in the sense of accepting everything, but where one can see the way in which a number of themes in Popper's work uh, were developed as a result of critical interaction with Nelson, Fries, and Kant. He also wrote on political issues, and some of his work on this theme is available in English in a, a book of Nelson's called Politics and Education. What he offered was essentially an updating of Plato's critique of democracy for his own times. And Nelson argued that there was a problem about democracy, namely that if one was a Democrat, one seemed then to be committed to whatever it was that the majority favored. While Nelson, by contrast, said that he, for example, favored justice and that he wouldn't stop favoring it even if the view of a majority of people in his society was against it. Nelson suggested that in the face of this problem, one should favor an approach to politics in which people were promoted internally in a political organization on the basis of their devotion to and ability to promote and to take further the ideals with which it's associated. And models here that he gave included the army and the Catholic church within which people he claimed were promoted because they were good and effective soldiers dedicated to the ideals of the army or similarly in the Catholic church, a promotion was made in terms of people's ability as demonstrated to uh, serve further the undeveloped the ideals of the Catholic Church. In addition to Nelson's writings, there was in fact a political organization, which after the Second World War and sort of shorn of its anti-democratic aspects played a role in the founding of the post-war Social Democratic Party in West Germany. Popper was formally invited to join. I mean, there was a kind of occasion when he was formally invited, would he join this organization? But he declined. And chapter seven of his Open Society on Leadership was apparently based on ideas that Popper originally developed as a response to the kind of arguments that one gets on the part of Nelson and those associated with him. At the same time, it should be said that Popper did intellectually rather than politically uh, continue uh, to have uh, friends amongst the people who'd been connected with Mel Nelson. There's a certain amount of correspondence with that. And uh, Julius Kraft uh, set up the journal Ratio, which was published in English and German, uh, the aim of which was really to continue uh, the approach of the Nelson uh, School, as it were, and Popper was a contrib uh, contributed, I think, the aim of science to that, and was generally uh, uh, on good terms with, uh, friendly with people who were part of this movement. 
but what in fact were Popper's own political views? They set out obviously in his open society and also in other subsequent writings. It's important to note that when he wrote the open society, Popper didn't yet have a theory of the rational discussability of philosophical ideas. And as a result, many of his own substantive ethical concerns tend just to be stated in the open society rather than argued for. While much of the argument in the book tends to be about methodological issues, which at the time fell within what for Popper was the scope of rational discussability. So what I'm saying is when you look at the open society, there's this sort of stress on commitment and so on running through it. But one way to understand this, I think, is that he felt passionately about the ethical and political issues that he was concerned with, but that he didn't have a theory to hand about their rational discussability. And where for Popper, this was always a sore point, just because he had friends amongst the Vienna circle who were utterly worried uh, about the status of metaphysics or of philosophy or anything else that wasn't empirical or methodological. At the same time, in the open society, Popper did also explain and discuss in chapter 24, what he called the rational attitude or the rationalist attitude. This he described as, and I quote, an attitude that seeks to solve as many problems as possible by an appeal to clear thought and experience rather than by an appeal to emotions and passions. And he further wrote that again, I quote, rationalism is an attitude of readiness to listen to critical arguments and to learn from experience. It is an attitude of admitting that, quote, I may be wrong and you may be right, and by an effort, we may get nearer to the truth. He also comments that it, and I quote, is very similar to the scientific attitude, to the belief that in the search for truth, we need cooperation and that with the help of argument, we can in time attain something like objectivity. So there's a sense in which Popper in the open society is appealing to something that is closely analogous to his approach to science. Indeed, Popper also writes, and I quote, it's an attitude which does not likely give up hope that by such means as argument and careful observation, people may reach some kind of agreement on many problems of importance. And that even where their demands and their interests clash, it's often possible to argue about the various demands and proposals and to reach perhaps by arbitration, a compromise which because of its equity is acceptable. This is important and striking stuff, but it's also worth noting that at the time, Popper didn't have to hand a theory as to how discussion of ethical or metaphysical ideas was to take place. And indeed, it's striking that when comparing the evaluation of a scientific and a moral theory, Popper writes, and I uh, uh, quote again, in the case of a moral theory, we can only confront its consequences with our conscience. And while the verdict of experiments does not depend upon ourselves, the verdict of our conscience does. Okay, so Popper favors an approach in politics and ethics, which is very close to that which he wants to take in science. He talks about the rational or the rationalist attitude and describes some of its features. He hasn't, however, got a theory comparable to the theory of the empirical basis in science, which he can point people towards if they asked him, well, how does this stuff take place? And as in this material that I've just quoted, there is a risk that in the open society, he ends up with what looks like appeals to the individual's conscience. 
This appeal to the individual's conscience is to be found worded even more strongly in the New Zealand lectures that uh, I mentioned before are included within uh, after the open society. But, and here I move to criticism, it seems to me unacceptable for the very reasons that Popper set out clearly in his logic of scientific discovery, see section eight. As Popper wrote there, I may be utterly convinced of the truth of a statement, certain of the evidence of my perceptions, overwhelmed by the intensity of my experience, but every doubt, sorry, every doubt may seem to me absurd, but does this afford the slightest reason for science to accept my statement? And to this, Popper's answer was clearly no. The same, I would suggest, is the case in respect of our conscience, that our feelings of moral conviction don't show that the judgment is in fact morally correct. As Popper argued in the logic of scientific discovery in respect of factual claims, we should go with the more Kantian approach of intersubjective acceptability. I can't explore this issue further here. It's rather more complicated than I've indicated because there may be matters of taste involved. Uh, it's also the case that you may feel strongly about something and then in a sense set out to try to convince other people that they should have the same view. But I have in a couple of papers uh, tried really to explore this a bit, but I certainly don't think that I, I can offer a satisfactory critical rationalist approach to ethics. But at the same time, it seems to me that Popper's appeal to the individual conscience it shouldn't be accepted as satisfactory either. That's to say, here and I think elsewhere, there are some issues in the open society about which we need to be careful and where if we're interested in critical rationalism and have got the opportunity to work on them, some more work would be all to the good. We need, I think, particularly to be careful in terms of an interplay between on the one side, a kind of science influenced or science modeled approach to morality and appeals to what are in effect intuitively held values, held intuitively just by the individual. What were the main features of Popper's approach to politics itself? I think that while this leaves a lot out, they may be roughly described as ethical individualism, what he called protectionism, what is in my view misdescribed as negative utilitarianism, and also fallibilism and piecemeal so social engineering. Let me describe these things in turn and explain the role that it seems to me they play in Popper's approach to politics. Ethical individualism, the idea that what matters is the well-being of each individual and their judgment, rather than the well-being of the state or the well-being of any collectivity, plays an important role in Popper's work. It's significant because at the time at which he was writing, both fascism and Marxism seemed to be, being, seemed to be putting collectivities first. In the one case, the state or the nation in the other class-based interests. Clearly, each could argue that from their perspective, individuals, or at least in the Nazi case, some individuals would in fact best flourish in the social order that they favored. While in the case of Marxism, that uh, there was this pretty standard argument that uh, the interest of the proletariat is to be understood as in the universal interest of mankind. Popper was critical of the idea that one could legitimately use the individual instrumentally for the sake of these collectivities. And he argued that people shouldn't overrate their theories or demand sacrifice of individual well-being in the short term for the sake of alleged even individual benefits in the future. There is surely an issue here. A lot of public policy assumes that it is in order to make trade-offs between the well-being and indeed the lives of citizens. Consider, say, only such matters as speed restrictions on the roads or 
features of COVID-19 policy at the moment. And this must of necessity be on the basis of knowledge which is fallible. I wouldn't dissent from Popper's criticisms in this area of Marxism and of fascism. But I think that the issues here are tricky ones, which again, I think, merit further discussion and exploration. Popper was also critical of that particular aspect of international law, of which I should stress in general, he was in favor. Popper was a strong internationalist, which centered around the interests of countries or nations rather than the interests or well being of individuals. He was also a scathing critic of nationalism, which he saw as incoherent and also as being highly problematic in its consequences. I think personally, there is a lot to be said for Popper's views here about nationalism. But there are again issues about what Popper's approach would mean in practical terms. And as we shall see, there is also an issue about the kinds of obligations we have to assist others. For example, what are people's rights with regard to immigration? And is what we owe to citizens and non-citizens the same? For example, in terms of assistance, if they are suffering. And if you want to say, well, uh, welfare is a matter of national policy and uh, uh, people uh, aren't going to be free to immigrate when they uh, wish to do so. Um, the question is, does one, it, it, what really uh, makes that work? And does one get back into some of the difficulties that Popper was criticizing when he was talking about nationalism? And whatever one's views about these things ethically, one can ask, well, what implications does it have for politics? All of this, it seems to me, may be in part understood as relating to Popper's concerns with the relief of suffering, but in part also, it displays a strong Kantian influence. Uh, this isn't so much a matter of the espousal of Kantian theories as a deep concern for the moral autonomy of the individual and an aversion to anything that smacked of heteronomy. These twin strands are brought out in what Popper called protectionism. This was a concern for the protection of the individual, in which context there figure not just traditional liberal concerns of the kind that are often referred to as negative freedoms, but also a concern for the protection of the individual against economic coercion. And if you ever find people claiming that, that Popper is a neoliberal, uh, in addition to, throw something at, to, to throwing something at them, uh, you might suggest to them that they care to read what he says in the open society about protectionism. All this is then expressed by way of a concern that the individual should be guaranteed protection by the state. Indeed, Popper in a couple of places voices the concern of which Philip Pettit and others in the so-called Republican tradition have more recently made much, that it's not acceptable that say an individual shouldn't be interfered with because as Popper puts it, of the goodwill of the inhabitants of a society, even of angels, but instead that their liberty should be guaranteed by the state. This notion that the state should be seen as the fount from which flows the protection of the liberty of the individual seems to me quite characteristic of Kant and of the Republican tradition more generally and of the role within these traditions of the rule of law. There is something important about the idea that our freedoms and rights shouldn't depend on the goodwill of or just the approval of others, and that they should receive institutional protection. At the same time, there seems to me a problem about it, just on the grounds that historically, the government has been as much an enemy of people's freedom and rights as it has been their defender. And so I think that while one can understand where Popper is coming from in this, 
And while the notion that there are these guarantees by our institutions is important, I, I guess my own sensibilities are much more to say, well, it's by no means clear that it's from the government or the state that you, you should be uh, looking for a safeguarding of these things. On the face of it, it would seem to me that a key issue here will be the moral recognition of people's freedom while it's a problem as to what institutional arrangements will best serve to secure it. Popper's protectionism would seem to me best interpreted as an aspiration for a framework which both formally and substantively serves to protect the individual. But what about Popper's ideas concerning what government should do? These are sometimes expressed when people are discussing Popper by invoking the idea of negative utilitarianism. But it seems to me misleading as a way of characterizing Popper's approach to public policy, let alone his moral philosophy. Negative utilitarianism is a respectable, if I think flawed approach in moral philosophy. Uh, it's the view that basically our moral concern, concerns should be with the relief of suffering rather than with trying to make people happy. The floor is the obvious point that John Stuart Mill makes with reference to Novalis, and which was subsequently reworked by Ninny and Smart as an argument against Popper, namely that if all that matters is the reduction of pain, then we would seem to be obliged simply to kill painlessly all those who are suffering, if indeed we could do so. In practical terms, negative utilitarianism is concerned with the idea that it's individual unhappiness that should be our moral concern, not their promotion, not the promotion of their happiness. Popper, say, is willing to leave the latter to individual initiatives, and is also critical of that tendency within utilitarianism, which suggests that we can simply play off unhappiness against happiness, as if it's all on a single continuum. There are important things to be said in favor of negative utilitarianism, including that pain or suffering surely indeed makes a demand on us in a, a way in which, say, simply increasing the well-being of someone who's, who is already comfortable doesn't. However, the idea that one shouldn't trade off unhappiness and happiness at all uh, seems to me really crazy, for clearly one would not wish to remedy mild unhappiness at the cost of measures which really seriously cut into other people's happiness and well-being. Second, Popper, as far as I can tell, puts no limits on the extent to which we should be obliged to attend to the unhappiness of others, or more accurately, how the relief of suffering interrelates to protectionism seems to me really not to be uh, explicitly clarified in Popper's work. And if one doesn't clarify this, and if one lets negative utilitarianism run riot, as it were, it seems to me to risk leading us towards the kind of absurdity that I think one gets to in Peter Singer's work, in which we are all in principle made what might be called slaves to even distant suffering. It seems to me that an acceptable ethical theory is one which certainly can recognize that we have obligations to assist others, but which also needs to secure uh, an, an area uh, within which people can flourish, within which people can uh, cultivate virtue, and doesn't demand that every single element of happiness in their lives should in fact be sacrificed uh, to make other people less unhappy. I think, however, that negative utilitarianism, in fact, misdescribes Popper's view. For, as is made particularly clear in his piece, Public and Private Values, which uh, we uh, printed in after the Open Society, his theory might be seen as a response to the problem that we can't get rational agreement about our substantive ethical concerns. Take 
for it seems to me that Popper implicitly works with this, a group of people who are in broad terms humanitarian and who are not committed to some particular systematic social theory. They might, however, in respect of their ethics, variously be liberals, socialists, utilitarians, Christians, or Muslims, perhaps. Popper's suggestion was that in the absence of any way of resolving by rational argument what is at issue between them, they might be asked to see to what extent they could agree on what is unacceptable to them. So people would be asked, in a sense, to put up candidates for things which are in their judgment, and they believe also will be in other people's judgment, problematic. This would mean that for each of them, there might be things to which they personally have a strong commitment, but which are vetoed by others as possible uh, subjects for uh, collective government intervention. But Popper thought it might nonetheless be possible for them to find that there was a lot that they could actually agree upon, and which might then form the agenda for governmental action. As to say, on Popper's account, government not only provides a protectionist framework, but also acts positively to try to address social problems. A few questions might be raised about how all this works. First, it's worth noting that in contrast to a view which, say, sees some idea of social justice as primary, what people would come up with when pursuing such an approach could well be quite uh, heterogeneous in its character. That's to say, not only would different people have different reasons for favoring different elements on the agenda, but because of the role played by the veto of others, the agenda wouldn't necessarily fit any single theory, just on the grounds that if the theory were correct, the agenda for action would also include other elements which other people would have vetoed. In addition, the kinds of things that Popper himself suggests might form an agenda include not just the remedy of suffering, but also the remedying of injustice. And this, it seems to me, uh, makes an immediate knockout point against seeing his theory as just being any form of utilitarianism. It's perhaps worth spelling out that if one did proceed in such a manner, then it's clear that what one could get agreement about could in some ways be rather limited. Consider as a contemporary example, the ideas of the Taliban who have just retaken political power in Afghanistan. They have inter alia influenced by a particular tradition in Muslim scholarship for whom the proper, they have been influenced by this tradition for whom the proper treatment of men and of women is different. That's to say it makes no sense for other people to demand that the Taliban respect what the other people claim are the human rights of women for on the kind of lowest common denominator approach that Popper suggests, what constitutes such rights is what everyone can agree to be such. And the Taliban, like the Deobandi, by whom they've been influenced in some respects, would argue that Islam, correctly understood, teaches that different conduct and rights, if one wants to use this terminology, are appropriate for men and for women, and that in consequence, it is unacceptable to claim uh, that there should just be the same human rights for everybody. There's a genuine issue here, I think, not just for Popper's approach, but for everyone, as to what is to be done in the face of genuine moral disagreement. The modern human rights tradition seems to me personally to be just hopeless here, as it appeals either to a supposed political agreement at the UN, from which, for example, the Taliban would clearly dissent, or to what are simply supposed to be obvious ideas about human rights, which are emphatically not obvious to those who don't agree with them. 
options here might be to see if some compromise could be reached or whether one could just agree to differ, for example, by having different laws in different territories with perhaps a policy of freely admitting into one's own territory refugees who disagree with the ideas where they're currently located. Although one problem is that the other people might impose difficult exit conditions on them, and also people might actually wish to move for all kinds of other reasons uh, than uh, opposition on these particular grounds. Or perhaps this is an issue about which you think one should fight. So what I'm saying here is these ideas of Popper's, which are in a paper of his, which seem to me to kind of explain what is at work in the open society, but which I stress Popper didn't himself publish, in many ways seem to be quite attractive and to be appealing to consensus, but there is a way in which if one takes these things seriously, one will find that it throws up some genuine problems for us, but it seems to me that it is problems that typically face everyone. I'll take questions at the end of the lectures. One striking aspect of Popper's own approach is that while in broad terms, his political approach could be called progressivist, he favors protection of people from economic exploitation. And if my memory serves correctly, at one point in the open society, I was looking at it not long ago, uh, he seems to me uh, to favor something close to the idea that's been quite a bit discussed recently of a basic income for all citizens. The thrust of his ideas about the agenda for politics, however, might seem somewhat minimalist in their consequences. That's to say, I think that there is on the face of it a contrast because if on the one side you favor perhaps uh, notions about basic income, uh, protection of people from economic exploitation and so on. On the other side of it, you say the agenda for government is really to be determined by what people can agree is unacceptable. Uh, there might well be a tension here. There are, though, some exceptions to this. And when law in the Schilp volume, The Philosophy of Karl Popper, when Lord Boyle took him Popper to task about it, Popper readily agreed that the government should uh, undertake expenditure of a broadly enabling character. I mean, for example, uh, public libraries, public swimming baths. I mean, all the kinds of things which if people come from a, a, a poor background uh, can make an incredible difference to their lives. And uh, Popper also in a uh, piece that's included in After the Open Society uh, favored uh, the state support of experimental schools of different kinds for kids. One can indeed, I think, give other examples of this from elsewhere in Popper's writings. One might second ask just what the relationship is between the protectionist and the so-called negative utilitarian agenda in Popper, not least because one worry about this aspect of the open society is that we might seem just to get a kind of wish list of Popper's concerns. One approach here, which is mine rather than something in Popper, would be to suggest that we give primacy to the procedure for settling an agenda. In addition, one might note that Popper also seems to allow for the possibility that people may be able to criticize their own and obviously other people's ethical theories when they see what they lead to. And I had some brief discussion um, of what Popper had to say about uh, George Bernard Shaw's St. Joan in this context in an earlier lecture. One might develop this further and allow for the possibilities of intersubjective criticism and thus bring in considerations from Popper's theory of the empirical basis uh, and place them a bit more closely uh, with his politics than he does. If all this is allowed for, we might argue after the fashion of John Stuart Mill's arguments in the subjection of women for the importance of individual autonomy for epistemological reasons. Mill essentially argued that 
one of the things which was problematic about the situation of women in his own society was that they were dependent on men for their living, for all kinds of other things. And that as a result, if they were asked, for example, uh, our uh, property relations as we have them in our society adequate, or uh, do you think the system of schooling is right? Or uh, do you think the freedom accorded to women is acceptable? That if they didn't enjoy autonomy from their husbands, they were apt not to be able to voice their criticism. And so if for Popper, the free ability to develop criticism of accepted ideas is important in terms of getting to truth or important in terms of getting towards valid moral ideas, then this gives us an argument as to why uh, all individuals should be assisted to be autonomous. This would thus provide an epistemological rationale for at least some elements of Popper's protectionism, while the rest of it might be seen as among the things that are generated by Popper's negative consensus approach itself. I don't know if this would work, but it would suggest one way in which one might try to offer a more systematic approach to this material. And just to restate what I'm, I'm trying to get at here, there are different strands of appealing argument in Popper's Open Society and then his other political writings, but it, it seems to me that it's not altogether clear how they knit together. I have in these comments both tried to highlight some of these issues, but also to make a few suggestions as to how drawing on elements in Popper, we might move towards remedying them. But I am certainly not confident that my criticisms are correct. And uh, I certainly don't think that, well, I'd be very surprised if uh, what I'm suggesting as ways to remedy these problems are, are actually acceptable. Next, fallibilism, piecemeal social engineering. Another key idea is Popper's fallibilism. He suggests that all our knowledge is fallible, including social theories and our ideas about what should inform public policy. In the social field, Popper also stressed the significance of the idea that our actions give rise to unintended social consequences, which might include the infliction of suffering on others, particularly as an unintended consequence of what might have looked to us to be really good ideas. All this leads him to a program for the critical scrutiny of the actions of government. But how should government proceed? In my view, Popper's approach would probably work like this. Initially, there would be consensual processes to try to determine an, an agenda for government action in terms of what people can agree is most problematic. Second, tentative ideas are formulated about what might be done. These are presumably discussed and then modified in the light of criticism. They, the result of this is then put into action and the results are submitted to critical scrutiny. Popper in this context stresses the idea that anyone may be able to offer useful suggestions, explicitly including people who couldn't come up with positive proposals of their own. And again, in this context, he writes briefly of the theme of the rational unity of mankind. In Popper's view, the idea that we are united in our ability to offer criticism. This, however, all poses, I think, a couple of problems. The first is that it isn't what clear what institutions would best realize this. For clearly, simply having people being able to tap things into social media hardly helps us at all. It's not discursive, there isn't good critical appraisal of what's going on. And so you have this ideal being offered by Popper of anyone in principle being able to make criticisms of uh, existing or proposed policies, but where it just doesn't seem clear how this is to be instantiated, or rather, 
what institutions might work. It's also striking that Popper, when he's writing about the mechanics of democracy, broadly favors a first past the post electoral system and is explicitly being critical of list type systems of proportional representation on the grounds that these PR systems don't enable the electorate to get rid of a government that they don't like. Someone may be absolutely appalling. They may though be the leader of a small party and always be put by the party on the top of its list. So pretty much however unacceptable they are to everyone else, if that party is going to get into the coalition, they are likely to turn up. One just doesn't have this ability to get rid of people who are dreadful. But how advocating such an electoral system fits with everyone as a critic of the substance of policy and also with ideas that Popper favored about the setting up of technical offices within government to appraise government policy doesn't seem to me to be immediately clear. And I take this again to be an area where Popper has made a number of interesting suggestions. But if people are interested in critical rationalism, a kind of fun task would be to see, OK, how might all of this work? And it suggests to me that there is indeed plenty of room for work by those interested in critical rationalism, especially, say, if they have a background in uh, rational choice theory, and also if they have a background in the actual institutional study of the working of politics, because uh, this uh, would mean uh, that they could uh, make useful comments about what in practical terms might work and what wouldn't. There is also, however, the theme of piecemeal social engineering itself. This is essentially an argument against undertaking measures from the failure of which it would be difficult to learn, or which if they did fail, would be likely to do a great deal of harm. In the open society, it's clear that Popper doesn't think that this means that we're only able to do trivial things. So the piecemeal mustn't be misread in that way. And from his correspondence with Carnap, it becomes clear that he's willing to consider experiments, for example, in the socialization of industry, but where these would be very much have to be seen as experiments. They need to be tentative, and we also need to learn if they go wrong so that we can then go back and do better. I will not say any more in terms of critical discussion of Popper's approach to politics, as I've written about this at some length elsewhere. But I will conclude with two brief comments. First, it seems to me that Popper himself is a bit too government focused. While he's a critic of laissez-faire, his work nonetheless shows some appreciation for markets and their importance. And I documented this at some length in uh, my uh, book on uh, Popper's political thought. He doesn't seem to me, however, to appreciate sufficiently the way in which markets can operate as discovery procedures with effective feedback from everyone from which entrepreneurs can then learn. And it's worthwhile bearing in mind in this context, just the sheer degree to which product launches are typically pretty unsuccessful. I'm not saying that in this respect, markets are in any way perfect, but uh, consumers are pretty good at indicating what uh, they think works and what they think doesn't. I also am not saying that what consumers choose is necessarily what is good for them, but where if you're interested in a popper style uh, learning by trial and error, uh, market-based phenomena uh, are quite interesting, particularly if you compare them to the relative poverty of feedback uh, in uh, the political realm. It also seems to me that it's perfectly possible to op extend the operation of markets into general problem solving. For example, by way of private companies designing, building, and running towns. This is a kind of 
uh, a hobby horse of mine, and I won't bore you further about this, but there is no reason why, uh, um, unless they're stopped by politicians from doing it, uh, private producers can't simply compete directly with government and effectively offer the equivalent of local government, but on a private basis. Indeed, the utopia section of Robert Nozick's Anarchy State and Utopia can be read as offering a model of Popperian learning from large scale private activity. Although if one wishes to investigate this, there are obviously a range of problems to be considered here. And I'd stress again, I think that what Popper is saying about government and about the importance of criticism in that context is absolutely vital and that we nearly, really need to work very hard to make things work better from that point of view. I'm just saying it's not obvious that everything has to be done by way of government in these areas. Second, as I, and as I've indicated elsewhere in these lectures, I think that there is a problem about Popper's approach in that possibly as a consequence of his repudiation of all aspects of essentialism, I don't think that he gives sufficient recognition to the role of structural constraints on our political activity. Not only if the economy is organized in certain ways, will this put constraints on what else we can do? We can make choices here, but once you do things in one way, it limits what else you can do at the same time. But one can say the same things about our choice of political systems. Once you have, for example, uh, a parliamentary democracy in which government is playing quite an active role, it's obviously going to have, to, it's obviously going to be the case that government then has to uh, consult with particular bodies who have specialized interests. So if you're running a government health service, you have to consult with and be advised by doctors. But this means that doctors have a great opportunity to press their particular interests as well as those that are in the general interest of the country. Similarly, if you get involved in anything to do with manufacturing or the service sector, you obviously have to consult with the uh, companies involved who are uh, uh, providing these services. And this then is likely to mean that uh, their ideas about how things should work, which may not be unconnected with what would be in their advantage for how things work, is what you get as part of the package. Reforms may be possible, different alternatives may be possible, but I think the crucial thing here is that if you're engaged in piecemeal social engineering, you have to bear in mind what the constraints of these kinds are that you are under. This, however, if I'm right, is not just a problem that arises in Popper, but also across most of contemporary politics. But all this is obviously an issue for another time, not for the end of an already rather overlong lecture. Thank you all very much. Okay. Uh, I have one hand up already. Uh, that is John. Actually, that was supposed to be a hand clapping. Uh, oh, I see. That's okay. That's well, quite I, right. that's I, quite I got right. just the one, and I, I took it to be electronic <laughs> heckling. And all, all, all no, I was, no, no, it was, no, it was all, before I took it down, and then I put up. No, I no, no. Put up a, a clapping hand. Okay. Uh, but it's it's all right. Uh, I mean, I could go respond now to what I was thinking of. Um, if I roll back to when you were talking about the human rights issue and all that um, mm. with the Taliban, et cetera, um, and tradition, the problem of tradition. Uh, what do you do about traditional values, et cetera? Uh, I think Popper's uh, um, piece um, in uh, um, Conjectures and Refutations towards a rational theory of tradition is quite useful there. He sort of makes an analogy between uh, uh, theories, you know, scientific theories on the one yes. hand and traditions on the other. So in the way that scientific theories can be, full, can be discussed and criticized, he has the same view towards, towards traditions. Um, 
uh, whether that helps us with the Taliban is another question. Well, the, Something think, like the dialogue of civilizations perhaps could, well, could help. Well, I out. think that the difficulty here is really that it's, I, I mean, let, let's put it this way. There may be people who simply take the view that perhaps Jewish people, perhaps people of a particular ethnicity really aren't people and just don't count. Now, I, I mean, in that setting, uh, clearly uh, the weight of argument may be on, on uh, others of us, but there might be a point where uh, people say, look, there is, if, if they're not counting means that you're um, basically going to exterminate them, then uh, this is something that we will just not countenance and so on. But it's a problem. Uh, I think the is on my understanding, the issue of the Taliban is that you've got a matter of folk practices being um, reinforced by uh, particular readings of um, the Islamic tradition. And these aren't arbitrary ones. I mean, I'm not saying that uh, there are not uh, Muslim scholars who disagree with this, but that where um, it is certainly a, a, a moot and arguable point. And what I would say is that if you go back to the situation that Popper was in, where he didn't really have to hand a theory about how these things, how one could have rational discussion about such matters, then you're, you're in real difficulties. I think by contrast, some other people are implicitly just over-optimistic and over-rationalistic about this and, and seem to believe that their mm -hmm. uh, pet moral ideas can just be demonstrated to be correct, where the uh, sad truth is that they can't. I mean, that uh, uh, typically, like all uh, human and philosophical ideas, one thinks they're fallible, that there can be argument back and forth about them, but that you so seldom... seems to have thought so. <laughs> well, no, because you see, what, what, what I was wanting to argue was that Popper's views when, around when he was writing The Open Society were, were really that... Um, there weren't uh, rational methods for appraising these matters, and that he seems to end up by appealing to people's conscience. But it's a standard issue in the in the philosophical literature. Well, uh, what about the con what about the conscience of the conscientious Nazi? I mean, there there can be two things. I mean, you can appeal to your conscience in the sense of it pulling you back to things that you think are right, rather than allowing you to indulge your immediate personal self-interest, like taking a cake, which it's clear should go to someone younger and smaller than you or something of this kind. But where if you actually have opposed moral ideas, then the, the, the problem is going to be uh, how do you set about dealing with these? And all I was wanting to suggest is, one, it's a genuine problem, which I think is with us now, that Popper's, as it were, political approach, I say political because there seemed to me to be something in common with John Rawls's later uh, uh, political approach, uh, where you see what, what there can be a consensus of, but with Popper saying, well, see what you can get a consensus of in terms of uh, what is to be avoided, then you may actually get somewhere. But it equally seems to me to be the case that uh, moral conscientious Muslims uh, may just be in disagreement with you about things. Similarly, uh, conscientious evangelical Christians may be at odds with uh, the the views that many of the rest of us take at the moment. Certainly, um, but it's it's a question of being able to rationally discuss them. That's that seems to be yes. what Popper is saying. Well, uh, yes, that's right. But the, but, if, but if a person doesn't accept rationality, then that's a problem. No, no, no. But you see, the problem that I am raising is that Popper is all in favor of rational discussion. And then you ask him, well, look, once you move away from science and methodology, 
what exactly does that consist of? And the and it seems to me that he he doesn't really until about the mid 1950s have any clear suggestions about this beyond talking about the rational attitude and so on and a kind of analogy with science but he doesn't offer a theory anywhere about just what well, the nitty-gritty of this might look like i was just gonna say what, what do you think of the myth of the framework he seems to be approaching it somehow there as well saying that he rejects the incommensurability of different yes, uh, yes, cultural yes frameworks yes that is true. He's, he's, he certainly takes the view that uh, we shouldn't rule out the possibility of learning from one another. But, the, but it seems to me that the big and still open question is, OK, take people who have different uh, moral orientations towards things. Um, take people who have different religious orientations towards things, just what is the structure of argument between them going to look like? And it's not obvious to me that we've got ready answers to this. And it also seems to me that um, the uh, typical approach that we get these days about people just invoking uh, human rights mm -hmm. uh, it isn't contributing to this. It's simply dogmatizing mm -hmm. their own particular preferred views about it, and they, which mm -hmm. may well be ones towards which I'm sympathetic, but I just don't think that that, that, that helps. Um, could I just make a, a, a point in passing? Look, if you mm -hmm. want to come in on the discussion, not, not to yourself, Margareta was, was, was just uh, making a comment via chat. We can't do anything with the chat thing. So can you stick up your electronic hand and I'll bring you in to that in okay. due course. Okay. Now, thank you, Margareta. Thank you, yeah. Okay. Now, I've got now three other people. Can we take a pause on this and possibly come back to it? Certainly, certainly. Yeah. Okay. I'll put my hand down. Yeah. Okay. Luke. Luke, uh, you're, you're muted, Luke. Luke? Luke, you're muted. I want to say something in general, something very specific, because there are many things and I think Philip wrote in his book about some of the things, so I'll let Ken say, say, some, say most. But I, I will quote Popper eh, from chapter seven in the Open Society. And he writes, the theory I have in mind is one which does not proceed as it were from a doctrine of the intrinsic goodness or righteousness of majority room, but rather from the basis of tyranny, or more precisely, at rests upon the decision or upon the adoption of the proposal to avoid and resist tyranny. I think that's a very important point. He often says that we should prepare for the worst. We should maybe try and have the best, but we should prepare for yeah. the worst kind of government. And there's this long interview with TV, I think it was German TV or Austrian TV, and it can be found on the internet. And the first thing he says is that when somebody asks you, give me full power of, uh, then I will, uh, that we should never give people full power and he wants to limit all. And you remember what you wrote about nationalism. It, it was very short and very clear yes. his views. And he wants to limit the power of the majority so that the minority- Yes. Yes. Okay. So he wants to limit all power. Uh, yes. from also from the government he wants to limit the power of okay. parliament yes look i don't disagree mm -hmm. but i i would then say the issues that i've been raising today mm -hmm. still then face us what becomes the basis for the agenda for government action and what institutions should we go for uh bearing in mind his concern that there should be the uh, uh, possibility of anyone being able to raise pertinent criticism of proposals. And I just don't know. I mean, Popper favors this, but I'm just not sure what would do it. But yeah, okay. I just noticed that this was something you didn't mention. The other thing is something very specific about you. You, you, you mentioned uh, refugees. And it's a difficult problem. But of course, like me, I was born in a rich country. That's a coincidence. 
life for me is a lot easier than somebody who was born in a poor country. So why do I have the right to live here? Why doesn't this is a problem? But of course, we can't live all in the same country because it's impossible. But on the other hand, the way they treat refugees now, like in Australia and also in England, actually, and almost in most countries, is that they punish them. Like in Australia, they put them there on this island uh, all alone. They punish them to show people, well, if you come here, that's what, that is what's going to happen to you. And this is actually what he says of Immanuel Kant. He also always repeats it, that you should not treat a human being solely as a, as a means to an end. And this is, this is what people are doing towards refugees. Actually, they are punishing them as an example and it's treating them as a means to an end. And this is okay. But, but one faces then the following problems. I mean, mm -hmm. first of all, is all does all suffering everywhere impose an equal obligation on us? Or is it only Belgian suffering or British suffering or whatever? Yeah, and but if, if people are here in, are, are in our country, are we allowed to treat them badly just to, 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 to use as an example? Well, that, mm. but, but, but the issue is, uh, second, uh, are we obliged to accept anyone who wishes to come as a refugee? And all I'm all I'm all I am saying about this is that, that there is an obvious case which you have made, but the question really is: Okay, in Popper, you have a, a a repudiation of nationalism, and I think his criticism of nationalism is telling. Yes, you you made a very great, uh, very short review uh, in your book. Yes, yes, but but the problem then is really this. You could say, well, all human suffering and all human well being has got an equal claim on everybody everywhere. Now, if you say that, then one has to think, right, uh, what will the implications of that be for? Uh, uh, existing welfare systems in countries like Belgium or Britain and so on, uh, uh, existing public provision of housing and so on and so on and so on. And all I was wanting to say is in these areas, it seems to me that there are very difficult but also unresolved problems. And it's not obvious to me that anyone is offering a coherent solution to yes, it. Yes, it's, it's a, yeah. And where the immediate humanitarian response that you voiced is obviously a very reasonable one, one then also has to say, okay, but what if one goes for that are the unintended consequences of it? And uh, I, I, I mean, all I'm trying to say in this regard is that it seems to me that in these areas, as in a certain number of others, Popper makes a lot of, of very important suggestions, but that there is a great deal of stuff which needs to be worked through uh, and looked at systematically, because I just don't think that at the moment it's very easy to fit some of the pieces together. But I don't think this is just Popper's problem. I mean, it seems to me that in, that in, in, in general, uh, people uh, tend just to hope. I, I mean, we were talking earlier about mm. Brexit and it was often then commented that uh, uh, the British Prime Minister, God help us, uh, uh, wanted to have his cake and eat it. Well, yes, yes. but there is a sense in which everyone at the moment seems now to want to be doing this. I mean, in Britain, you have as a result almost kind of endless agendas for areas in which government spending needs to be increased drastically in order to make institutions work, but where people just don't put two and two together and say, well, wait a minute, you know, it, it, that, that, that just isn't at the moment any easy answer 
to how all of this is going to happen at once. So all, all I'd say in this regard is I'm a great fan of Popper's Open Society, but I think that it poses a lot of, of uh, interesting and very live problems to anyone who's keen on his work. Okay, well, Philip wrote about some of the stuff. I will let him, uh, him talk now, okay? Bye-bye. Sure, okay. Yeah. Thank Philip. you. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I have a few points, uh, not 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 necessarily on on what I previously written about, but but in response to what what uh, Jeremy has has said. Um, can I start with the the uh, rational discussability question and yes. the decidability? And I, I think this is something that uh, Popper, um, on the one hand, has a recognition that there are limits to toleration and there are limits to what you can. Um, how far you can go with, um, you know, the, the, the whole paradox of, of toleration is that at some point or other, you decide that uh, you cease, to, the, the argument ceases and you have to impose a decision, it seems. Um, quite what the criteria should be at that point um, um, is, is left rather vague. Um, and, you know, Pop Popper doesn't, doesn't say when you should end the, the conversation, but, but clearly there is a, a certain point and it's not, not simply a conversation with those who are committed to using their fists and their pistols rather than their reason. I think that, they're, 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 I mean, clearly uh, he indicates that uh, he would not extend toleration to those who, through speech, through, through rational advocacy, are seeking to, uh, seeking unreasonable reimposition of slavery, for example, or, or et cetera, et cetera. Um, that there is at the same time, a kind of naive optimism that, that keeps resurfacing in Popper, and it's it's wonderful. It, it, I, I would never wish to to um, uh, ha have it removed, but but there, I mean, even at the end of his life, he is he had has a an interview uh, with a a journalist. I think it was the Italian an Italian journalist, um, and he was talking about the population uh, question being a crucial uh, uh, problem for post-Cold War world, um, and essentially suggesting that um, birth control, including perhaps abortion, would have to become accepted, and that uh, when, when, when the Pope is mentioned as, as a, a real um, opponent of that, uh, Popper optimistically says, well, the Pope will come round. I mean, there, there, is, there is this, uh, he, he, he does not, <laughs> um, even there, even though he recognizes that that is perhaps, uh, in, in his view, a, a critical problem for the post-Cold uh, War world, um, work out where you uh, end toleration of further discussion and, and uh, um, et cetera. He, he assumes that, there, uh, that effectively uh, the reasoning process can continue without, without such commitment. Um, I, I had put into the chat a... Um, a little while ago, a suggestion that uh, what Popper was groping his way toward, uh, but never perhaps fully embraced, was this, what I described as a principle of a liberty maximizing self-restraint of an empowered majority. It's a bit of a mouthful, uh, <laughs> but um, assuming that, um, that, that a majority is uh, perhaps uh, committed or perhaps interested in uh, equalizing suffering, which is one of the um, ways in which Popper seemed to be the uh, pr proposing um, the, uh, policies in, in, in uh, the open society and its, and its enemies, um, that that is, um, he, 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 he recognizes that although um, he doesn't define democracy as majority rule, he, 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 the majority still gets to call uh, the shots in terms of which policies are not pursued. Um, so, um, I, so I'm suggesting that, that what Popper's um, principle, the principle that he was, he was working his way towards is a liberty maximizing self-restraint of an empowered majority in, in this area. Um, a third observation, and, and uh, if, if I may, um, you, you, you've mentioned his uh, discussion of, of Plato and his dismissal of the, um, the mainstream English uh, interpretation, and he thinks that that is often um, misleading. Um, and I agree that that it is often a, a misreading. But what, what it seems to me is that, that Popper then imposes his own um, woefully uh, 
erroneous uh, in interpretation uh, in, in some some respects. Um, uh, what he does not seem to uh, give any consideration to in the Open Society and its enemies, or indeed in his subsequent work, is that what Pop, what Plato was um, describing was, um, if you will, the unintended consequences of other uh, proposals for social change that, that he was taking on, in other words, um, ideas that he then exposes to be inadequate in their consequences, uh, the, the ideas that Critias in particular had, had advanced. Um, instead, Popper seems to identify Plato with the, the party of Critias and the, the party of um, the, the, the old tyranny. Um, so so this, this seems to me uh, uh, particularly unfortunate. I, I think uh, the, the Republic can be treated very nicely as an illustration precisely of an analysis of unintended consequences of political programs, um, and that Plato was uh, pursuing an, an, such an analysis. I think the same could also sometimes be said of Marx. And again, it is unacknowledged by, by um, uh, Popper. I mean, for example, uh, Marx's critique of the Gotha program is really a critique of the consequences of, La, of Lasallianism and, and of the implementation of Lasalle's ideas by the unified German Social Democratic Party after the, the Congress in, in uh, 1875. Um, again, there does not seem to be any recognition that any of these other theorists who he, um, to, to whom he counterposes, if you will, a, a theory of unintended consequences were themselves uh, perhaps exploring um, the unintended consequences of alternative theories, if you will, um, and, and showing where they might lead contrary to the intent of their authors. A fourth point, if I may, um, is you, you talk about Popper's uh, advocacy of first-past-the-post systems and his dismissal of party list PR, and that is absolutely correct. What is striking about his discussion, about his engagement uh, with this topic, is that he ignores the most frequently advocated form of PR in Britain at that time. At the time, the Liberal Party uh, in Britain, and indeed, if you look around in um, most... Um, the, the uh, contemporary um, Anglophone democracies, such as that of the Republic of Ireland, uh, that the type of PR that you had there, the type of proportional representation that you have there, is that of single transferable voting. Um, the, <laughs> um, it, 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 it is remarkable that Popper himself does not uh, treat of those um, the, the, those, those uh, variants, but simply goes for the relatively easy target uh, of, say, the Israeli-style National Party list system, um, which uh, he counterposes to, to the um, uh, accountability offered by a first-past-the-post system, ig ignoring the history, effectively, of the Republic of Ireland. One additional point, if I may, uh, and that, that kind of reconnects with what Thomas had mentioned last week about was, Mar was Popper ever a really a Marxist? And what was he attracted as a 16 year old to, um, to, uh, to, the, to the, uh, the Communist Party? It, it struck me at the time that what Popper really was attracted to was peace. Uh, as a 16 year old seeing, um, gradually getting presumably to, to military age himself, um, the, 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 the startling uh, and most celebrated aspect that, that he offered of, 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 of um, rec recognition of what communists had achieved was the pre Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, was the end of the war on the Eastern Front, was um, a move towards peace. Um, that was his commitment early on to, 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 the, um, to this. It seems to me that that remains a core um, commitment for Popper in, in his ethical and his political writings subsequent to, to the Second World War. And, and um, he is committed not only in the Open Society and its enemies, at least in some of the extensive footnotes, to uh, the possibility of an international government emerging, an international executive armed uh, sufficiently to, to enforce um, the international peace and to, to punish aggressors. He's committed also to protection of national minorities living within states. Um, and But he's also even at the end of his life, that, that is a theme that he comes back to in the light of the uh, onset of the Bosnia atrocities, for example. Uh, he asked, he argues for a much more robust international presence, a much more robust version of what was then called UMPRAFIL, the, the United Nations Protection Force in the former Yugoslavia, um, which could defend the 
uh, Bosnian Muslims and could um, resolve the peace. He, he, uh, so, so a commitment to peace, sometimes a commitment to enforcement of peace through military force, interestingly enough, um, is a key ingredient, a, a key um, element of, of Popper's uh, approach to politics and to ethics. And it arguably is what inspired his initial admiration of the communists, uh, motivated his, his uh, brief membership of that party, and partly explains why when they resort to open violence uh, in, in the very manipulative way that they did uh, in, 20, in 1919, he becomes, uh, he, he recognizes the distance that they have from his uh, particular policies. And anyway, or his, his particular principles. Um, one last point, perhaps, um, and you talk about market solutions, uh, and you also favorably refer to Nozick. Um, I have some reservations about Nozick, but, but it's, uh, um, but, but I, let, let's not go there. What, what, I, what, what strikes me and what, what I didn't hear mentioned in your presentation was Popper's recognition that there is a paradox of the free market. That for the, free, for the market to be free, it must be regulated because an unregulated free market becomes very rapidly unfree because it becomes dominated by various political actors, unions or, or uh, cartels, et cetera. Um, anyway, so that will be six, six very briefly. Okay. I, I will, I will, thanks very much. I'll respond briefly. Look, the issue of rational discussion that I was raising was that, as I mentioned with regard to the footnote in Objective Knowledge, Popper didn't have to hand until something like the 1950s an account of how um, non-empirical ideas could be critically appraised. I mean, he was clearly all for the idea that they should be, but he didn't, and this includes the time that he was writing The Open Society and a bit beyond, have any account of how those things were to be handled. And my, I, I, I mean, the, the point that I was making was in a sense restricted to that, which to my mind explains why uh, in addition to the rational attitude stuff and so on, there is this almost oddly existentialist feel to bits of the open society and to a kind of commitment to various sorts of values and where he really um, in many respects ends up uh, just talking about how you might be able to resolve disagreements with people who are themselves basically humanitarian, but have just been led astray by problematic methodological ideas. And so all, all I was wanting to say about that, and, and I, I mean, the issues you were raising seem to me to bear, bear to be fair enough, but all I was wanting to say is if we approach this early writing of Popper's, one has to bear in mind that it, it doesn't have the kind of thoroughgoing rationalism and ideas about how one could actually engage critically about ethical disagreements that one might expect of him. And that while later it's clear that he uh, thought that it was possible, he didn't return to those things and provide us with a detailed theory about that stuff. In terms of the specific things that you're raising and that uh, toleration, I plan uh, if uh, I uh, survive that long and if there's still ever any audience to talk about Popper and toleration in the second series. And I agree about the naive- Always, Jeremy, always. Well, we'll have to see. I, I mean, COVID may get me, uh, I, I rate Popperians may get me. I mean, one can never tell quite what will happen. But I, I think Popper has some 
quite distinctive and interesting and but challenging things to say about toleration. Um, and the stuff in After the Open Society, the letters to Isaiah Berlin, which included uh, his saying things about the Salman Rushdie stuff, seem to me to be very interesting about this. Um, the uh, related to the optimism is this issue about internationalism. I mean, it's clear, uh, and, and I, I fully endorse what you said about this, Philip, that up until the very last, he was in favor of international intervention in Bosnia and so on and so on. The, the problem is, uh, what does this actually mean? Does it mean international intervention in Afghanistan? Does it mean, I, I, I mean, let, let's, put it, let's put it this way. I think that there is a problem of the deep rootedness of uh, traditions and ways of life in different parts of the world tied in with uh, particular economic circumstances. And that I think in some ways that Popper's suggestions about international interventionism are, are, are tempting where, uh, I mean, there's a problem of your infallibility, but if you are if you are willing to put sufficient resources into it, this might seem tempting. And, or if you're doing something in relation to what is reckoned to be a kind of temporary aberration somewhere, which can be sorted. But I think that the, uh, the, the horror that many of us have about the path in the led Western countries into assuming somehow that if it could uh, move against really horrible dictators, this would enable uh, societies to be put right uh, without saying, well, what would nation building actually involve? Do we, can we make the financial commitment, but at another level also, who are we to do this? I mean, there, there is a, a difficulty that this stuff uh, can kind of wear a colonialist hat to it. And so while, again, at a certain level, I'm, I'm sympathetic to Popper, I, I also think that we've had a number of striking examples of ways in which people have intervened into, the, into other people's lives uh, for what they took to be humanitarian reasons where the outcome was dreadful, such that one really has to think extremely carefully about this stuff. I mean, uh, I mean, basically, if I can so put it, buggering up most of the Middle East uh, is a, a, a recent achievement of something like this attitude. And so I, I think one has to be very careful. Plato, uh, I would agree. I mean, I think that what Popper, uh, Popper goes into that in a manner that is polemical. He scores some important points. I mean, some Plato scholars said, yes, indeed, you know, he's put his finger on a number of things that people just kind of brush to one side, and that there is stuff, for example, in the laws, which looks really pretty horrific, and so on. And that the kind of treatment of um, Plato as almost a Christian gentleman before his time who uh, would have done quite well uh, running a major British public school, uh, or at least would have, would have been good at making speeches for them. Uh, I, I think he, he makes some striking points. On the other hand, uh, a, while he has criticized the translations of um, uh, 
a number of, of Platonists. It's also the case that his translation and general treatment of Plato has been taken to task by Plato scholars who in certain other ways are quite sympathetic towards him. And I think that one has to see this as being a kind of um, uh, interesting and polemical intervention by a clever man from whom people can learn some things, but where just to take it as being simply uh, uh, how we should read Plato is a, is, is a, a, a trickier business. But, but the, Jeremy, on, on, on specifically on, on his disregard for anybody else's interest in unintended consequences, almost as if this is something that does not precede the modern Austrian school's um, development of the concept and 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 no so he, no 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 but, because he credits it explicitly to marx but not to plato he does not uh, recognize any aspect no of, no look no. i would i would agree but but i mean what i'm trying to say is that he as far as i can tell and this is a matter of personal interactions with him was really impressed by and drawn towards plato but he, in a sense, got fed up with having Plato and uh, being uh, depicted in the kind of way that I was alluding to. He makes, I mean, he beavers away and makes some good points. I don't think, though, and I, I, I uh, tried to indicate this. I mean, I don't think that it is a, a good overall reading of Plato. I think that it played a role as an important corrective to, uh, to some things. And I mean, there is an immense amount to be said about Plato. There, there are the Straussians who think that he's completely misunderstood. And, and I, I mean, there, there is a, a, a vast lot of stuff there. Um, I deliberately didn't set out to give a treatment of uh, Popper on Plato. I mean, not least because I'm not a Plato scholar myself, and what I've read does seem to have this sort of sort of mixed uh, uh, mixed character to it. And he does, from time to time, talk about the acuteness of Plato's sociological approach. But I think that in the open society, he is not setting out um, to give credit where it's due at every turn, other in some respects uh, than to Marx, where it seems to me that he kind of bends over backwards to uh, be, uh, I mean, while he's critical, he's, I mean, for example, he, he I think, is, um, over uh, reliant on the accuracy of what Marx said about the workings of capital. And um, that in broad terms, I mean, in, in Plato and Heraclitus, he is kind of uh, utterly against them because he thinks he they're sort of uh, disparaging ordinary people. He is highly critical of uh, democracy in the uh, uh, Plato's treatment of democracy without, I think, really giving acknowledgement to the fact that what you're dealing with is something that's akin to Trump. I mean, that, um, I mean, that's to say he, Popper tends to go for the kind of high-minded spokes, uh, spokesman that he likes, and not to say much about the sometimes dubious other aspects of their views, but where, um, I mean, I am no classical scholar on this, but my understanding is that the, that, uh, I mean, running right through from the Greeks, the Romans, through into the church councils, uh, uh, democracy uh, was uh, very much of a kind uh, uh, of Trumpian populist character. And so I think that it's, it, it, it's perfectly reasonable that Plato is concerned about it. And I mean, one uh, general comment that I'd make there is, and I think I alluded to this previously, 
You see, Popper is critical of experts. He is keen on the idea that all, all theories should be exposed to criticism. And this is fine. But what about the problem of our need to entrench and give a certain respect to whatever our best ideas are at a certain point? And I mean, you could talk about this in terms of the COVID stuff at the moment. I mean, that you, you've got the, the toleration of a whole lot of nincompoops who um, think that their views about stuff where they seem to know nothing are equally as good as those who have uh, done reasonably detailed study, who have looked at and have grappled with criticism. And I think a, a, a problem about our society, but a problem in a certain sense about the, the open society as Popper depicts it is that um, it's not very clear um, how you give the sort of respect that I think we need to give to fallible ideas and ideas that need to be exposed to criticism, but which are nonetheless the best we've got, which will typically extend way beyond what most of us are at any one point uh, capable of passing any sort of judgment about. Sorry, that's a, a, uh, as, as to the market stuff, I mean, I think what Popper says about laissez-faire and markets is just ignorant. Um, I, I mean, that's to say, a good friend of his was Hayek. Hayek emphasizes very strongly the significance of a setting of the rule of law for the operation of markets. And his big concern is uh, essentially, how do you stop conspiracies against the, uh, uh, the, the public interest? And uh, Popper treats it as if proponents of, of, of market approaches are a, a particular kind of weird anarchist of whom there are a few in America, but which really doesn't represent a, a, a kind of major opinion on, on anything. And the Nozick stuff is, is purely the utopia section where, he, where um, there is this notion, and you could see it in, in continuity with uh, what uh, John Stuart Mill talks about in terms of experiments in living, that there are ways other than having government do things in which you may be able to get, you may give people the opportunity to try out ideas, but you clearly need various protections and forms of rescue if everything goes badly and so on. But that is a, is a, uh, another big topic on which I could bore you silly with things including um, uh, celebration in uh, Florida and Reston in Virginia and various other such matters, but we've got enough on our plates with Popper. Thanks very much, Philip. Now I've got Margareta and then John's second hand. You're, you're not, yes. Yes. So uh, I, I just wanted to make uh, a comment um, on that you said that Popper hadn't really thought about it uh, and, and you repeated it, something Sorry, that he had. About what? Well, if you could repeat it, that would be helpful. But thinking through something until the mid 1950s. Yes, uh, this is, a, this is a, a, a broad theme that I've stressed through the lectures, yes. namely, that as Popper explains in a footnote, which I've quoted to everyone from objective knowledge, that basically when he wrote the logic of scientific discovery, uh, logic of scientific discovery, and this then continues, he limited the range of what was open to rational appraisal implicitly to empirical and methodological and formal claims. Now, as I've ind also indicated, in the open society, he is champing at the bit about this. He wants to go beyond it, and he wants, for example, in terms of what he says about the rational attitude to go beyond it.
but he only sets out a theory about how you appraise metaphysical ideas in something that appears in about 1958. And all I was wanting to say is that this is a, first, this is a feature of Popper's work, and second, that it introduces a tension between his wider rationalism and his propensity to engage in wider arguments, and as it were, the official idea that he's got, and that this has the consequence that, for example, in the open society, say, there are appeals just to values. There are appeals to the conscience and so on um, of a kind that uh, I think anyone who's thought about what Popper's wider approach would be would want to blow the whistle and say, look, there is something that, that just isn't working properly here. Yes, and so I would like to say that, actually, I would like to make a minor correction then, Jeremy, and say that in 1949, and, and we, we have mentioned that, um, does that he he for the first time I guess went on the record publicly about the distinction between the third descriptive and the fourth argumentative function of language. Now Popper claims that he got the idea already in the late 1920s. Uh, well, what I just wanted to say is that there is a possibility of reading Popper that he actually has something in mind. There's that distinction between the third descriptive and fourth argumentative function in language. But then he, he never, I mean, it takes him another 20 years to develop it more in detail. And then, and then we wish, of course, that he had done much more with it. But, but then you were the one who told us that he's so busy with medical problems and and, but, and but, other distractions, so so that um, I, I'm making a theoretical point. So look, I, I, I'm what not you're saying that. is is true enough, but I don't yeah. think it really addresses the point that I was raising. Just in the That's, following terms, yeah. that the problem that Popper faced, for example, if if he uh, talked about his metaphysical ideas with friends from the Vienna Circle, is that they would say to him. Okay, how are these how are these things to be rationally discussed and appraised? And it is the answer to that that he seems to come up with. I mean, it's it's a fairly simple idea when he brings it onto the scene. And I also think, and I've tried to explain this, that um, much of his work, such as in the poverty of historicism in a way only makes sense if his argument is seen as falling into an uh, argument about the uh, feasibility and desirability of different research programs in the social sciences. But he didn't have, when he was wanting to discuss these things, the approach that he needed. And I also don't think that the very important stuff that you're referring to actually in itself resolves the problem because it talks about discussion but when the problem is more what is the character of a rational discussion of non-empirical uh, uh, non-methodological non-formal material and it's that that he only gets on to later okay uh, i i believe uh my answer may be for, for the next uh, Popper conference, not okay. for now, but, but I would like to make another comment when we were all talking about negative utilitarianism and everything. I couldn't help but notice a lot of what, what we call psychologism, uh, that everyone is thinking that they know what makes other people happy or so, so that the, it, it is, and I think that's the whole point of psychologism, uh, or that Popper is anti-psychologist, is that he says, and you pointed it out yourself, whatever I'm thinking by itself, that doesn't mean anything. So I cannot have a discussion about what other people, what makes them happy or not. And it makes more sense 
and and I was just curious because you 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 kind of brought it up, but maybe not as clear. Uh, getting back to the comment that uh, Philip made in the chat room, uh, we can't decide what makes someone else happy, but what we can decide is to give that person some free time so that he can choose for himself how to be happy. We can also give him the tools to think, so he can really. Everyone can decide for themselves to be happy. And what we need to do is make sure we don't take people's time away by minimum wage or, or below minimum wage or by making them do all sorts of things that can be much better done by some institution. So so we give people freedom and then we can become well, yeah. two issues there. I mean, first of all, Popper certainly thinks that we can better we're uh, better able to judge uh, if someone is suffering than if they're happy and on the face of it uh, you don't have to give a uh, psychologistic reading to this I mean you can say such things as uh, if a human being is um not getting uh food and water that they yeah. objectively need provided that they, it, this isn't part of say a religious fast or something of this kind then okay but i mean i i would say on the other side of this um i think that it is a an interesting question as to whether people are um actually good at making choices for themselves. Let me tell you a little story. Um, I remember uh, when I was in the US, uh, there was a series of adverts on the television, which came up with this theme, be all you can be in the US Army. And the notion here was, first, that I think the army were claiming they could probably do a better job of making, of bringing out your potential than you could yourself. And second, it seems to me that they may well be right. I mean, that's to say, um, if someone is wanting to be a, uh, a, a star athlete, then uh, they're, they're a fool if they don't give themselves over to uh, a, an effective trainer. It, but the same seems to me to be roughly facing us in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, there is no special reason to suppose that, uh, we, that, that, that the aims we set for, for ourselves are actually sensible ones, or that our efforts to get there will be will necessarily be very effective. And I don't think that forcing everyone in, into the army is a good way to go, but it seems to me to be a kind of part of a false modern ideology that uh, uh, choice and uh, molding yourself is good for everyone. And typically if people are faced with this situation, they end up becoming sheep, following uh, influences on uh, social media who, who are paid to give them things that certainly aren't in their interest. So uh, I, I agree that the popper <laughs> is interested in, in the suffering and that the suffering that can be really well understood. But regarding the freedom, I, I, I think it's, something that maybe hasn't discussed too much that very much part of Popper's philosophy, I guess, is that there is an educational system in place that really gives everyone uh, an, an experience in education that, that people, they learn how to argue at the university, an ideal type of university maybe that doesn't exist anymore, uh, but, but that people need to get some education and none they can make the decision so so if we think about popper without any education then yes then it will oh. be horrible the world we get but, okay yeah but 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 look popper on 
education is an interesting field. There are a number of people who've written who take up ideas that Popper has developed and make of him a kind of very highly child-centered approach. But he certainly talks about children's problems. On the other hand, he, in his own um, uh, it, in his own practice, the way in which he went, and which I think fits his epistemology, is to tell people about problems, to tell people about uh, ways in which people tried to solve them, and give people an opportunity to raise problems and issues about these, but often then to tell people about what some of the criticisms were that people raised. I mean, the problem, it seems to me, I mean, th this, this isn't something I can go into now. I mean, both because our time is, is, is just about up and uh, also because this issue of popular education is massive. But a key thing to bear in mind is that human knowledge has been a product of incredible efforts over a huge period of time. And though, and this is me, not Popper now, that those progressive educationists who think that children can be expected in the classroom to reinvent essentially what uh, was years of work by generations of people, all of whom were a lot smarter than them, just seems to me to be uh, madness. But as I say, I mustn't vent further on this. I've been venting on too many things in this. And I need quickly to ask John if he's got something because I, I'm due to be somewhere else in five minutes time. John. Very quickly. Um, I think uh, the key here is, is rationalism. Uh, and Popper has a very complex notion of rationalism that is, has a moral component as well. And I would say, as far as this problem of, tra of, of tradition is concerned, you've actually uh, um, proposed a very, a very interesting solution yourself with the epistemological argument. You know, if you can argue that uh, um, the freedom of women, for example, uh, allows for a better uh, uh, decision-making process within the society, then I think that's a rational argument okay. for it. And I think uh, it may be possible to have such a rational argument, even with people with very settled Okay, yes. all I would say That's is, all, I to to say. all I'd say on that one is that that in principle looks to me perfectly compatible with what I understand the Iranian, the current Iranian government approach. I'm not a particular fan of theirs, but where you basically have a system in which women can play pretty much any um, function in society, but where uh, they have to bring their own uh, confinement with them mm -hmm. in terms of a mode of dress, although it's not one which blocks out their faces and, and thus uh, uh, key elements in communication. But all I'd say about it is, yes, I mean, this, if it works, might be an epistemological line of argument, which you, you could say has a certain priority over any other particular tradition. Uh, on the other side, I think one mustn't just poo-poo traditions that are different from our own, mm -hmm. as we ha tend to have a habit of doing. I'm sorry, I, I just have to stop at this point because I, I'm, I, I'm due to be with my wife doing something else in all okay. three minutes. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, I've written to Philip because we talked about a discussion and I'm wondering whether we might try possibly a symposium on Philip's book at a forthcoming Popper conference. But let's, let's explore this and see how it goes. Talking of conferences, there is the Popper conference next week, the, the coming Saturday. And if anyone doesn't have uh, an invitation to that and wants one, email me and I will send you the papers and, and an invitation to it. Okay. Thank you all very much. And I now I fear have to run. Cheerio.